Hi, everybody. My name is Phil Menser. I'm the director of the Observatory on Social Media at Indiana University. And today I'd like to tell you about research in our lab. I have a clickbait title for reasons why social media make us vulnerable to manipulation. So let's get started with reason number four. A few years ago, our lab uh, became the target of a disinformation campaign that was attacking our research on the detection of social bots and online manipulation. It made up a lot of crazy, crazy claims. I'm not gonna go into those claims, but they became quite viral, um, started out in some hyperpartisan websites. It went to some mainstream places like Fox News. There was in congressional investigations and it went to fake news websites. Eventually got propagated by Russian misinformation sources. All this despite the fact that these claims had already been debunked um, right at the outset by trusted sources like Science Magazine, for example. Now, when this was happening, it was during the midterm elections of 2014, uh, there was a lot of um, traffic on social media, a lot of posts that, uh, by people that believed this uh, information and attacked us or spread uh, false claims about us. So we looked at how this information was spreading on Twitter from person to person. So this is a network where the nodes are accounts, Twitter accounts, and connections between them represents spreading of articles um, with uh, various kinds of misinformation, false claims about, about us. Now, when you take this network and you look at it in the broader context of the conversation that was going on at that time about the midterm elections, of course, you're not surprised to find that uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was a sort of an echo chamber uh, type of conversation online. Conservatives tend to retweet other conservative accounts. Liberal uh, accounts tend to retweet other liberal accounts. There is not a lot of cross communication. And this misinformation, which is here represented by these purple nodes, was mostly spreading on one side of the political spectrum. And perhaps you can see there are a couple of orange nodes here on the left. Those are uh, two accounts that were sharing, actually debunking information, articles from science. And so what this picture tells you is that even if fact-checking debunking information is available about a particular uh, piece of uh, some false claim, uh, the people who are most vulnerable to it are not necessarily exposed to those corrections. Here, people on the right were not exposed to the debunking, which was spreading on the left. And of course, the other way around could also happen. Now, to study the role of these echo chambers uh, in spreading misinformation, among other things, we launched a bunch of bots. Uh, and these are completely neutral bots that take completely random actions, and they are initialized by following a news source, either on the left or on the right or in the center. And then we looked at these bots over a period of several months to see what kind of information they were exposed to and what they retweeted. Again, their behaviors were random and completely identical, irrespective of whether these bots started. And what you see here is that the bots that started on the right side of the US political spectrum uh, were exposed to a lot more links from low credibility sources and even themselves retweeted a lot of these, of these links. Of course, the bots themselves were not politically biased. They had no political <laughs> belief or, or, or any political behavior at all. They were just doing things at random. So this tells you that the environment in which we, are, we, we find ourselves on uh, social media could have a strong effect on our exposure to misinformation. Other people have looked at this question. Uh, for example, here is a paper by our colleagues at Northeastern um, who looked at um, uh, people who spread uh, news from low credibility sources, uh, and these were likely voters and their political affinity. And they found that similarly to what I just showed you, there was a strong correlation with political uh, tendencies. In particular, uh, Republicans were more likely to uh, share uh, fake news. However, if you look uh, more broadly, uh, not just the voters, but uh, uh, social media accounts, you find that this tendency is not only among conservatives. Okay, here we see that on the x-axis political bias from left to right, 
and on the y-axis uh, sharing of links to low credibility sources. And even on the left, there is a correlation. Although it is stronger on the right, there is also uh, this kind of vulnerability on the left. So it's not just that conservatives are more vulnerable to misinformation, but in general, that partisan um, accounts and politically active people, and that includes many of us, are vulnerable to manipulation through misinformation. And we found the same thing with our bots. Uh, here, um, we showed the ego networks of, of, of some of these uh, bots. Again, the bots were completely neutral. The only difference was whether they started following some conservative news sources or some liberal news sources. And you find that they find themselves in echo chambers where most of their friends and followers tend to have similar political opinions to their own, on, well, or to the uh, news that they started following. Uh, blue for liberals on the right and red for conservatives on, uh, sorry, blue for liberal on the left and red for conservatives on the right. There were a few exceptions. For example, this bot here um, ended up in a, in a group that had both liberal and conservative accounts. And here is a funny example here of an account that uh, started from uh, center right, from following Wall Street Journal, but then at some point started following CNN and ended up in a more of a liberal uh, echo chamber. So this tells us that um, a few actions, especially early actions in deciding who to follow, have a huge impact on the kind of echo chambers that we find ourselves in on social media and the kind of information to which are we are exposed. And we, our team and others have found very strongly that, um, that both on the right or on the left, um, we, we find ourselves in these, uh, in these uh, environments where we're more likely exposed to information that is conformant with our own opinion. So a question that we were interested in exploring is whether the fact that we are uh, exposed to information on a social media platform uh, plays a strong role in the formation and emergence of these echo chambers. So we developed a, an agent-based model. In this model, uh, the nodes here represent new accounts and their colors represent their political beliefs. Again, from left, blue to right, uh, conservative, um, um, red. And uh, there are two basic ingredients here. One is that we produce, uh, we post uh, information that reflects our beliefs and our political tendencies, and that we can be influenced to a very small extent by the information that we are exposed to that is posted from our friends or that our friends repost. So um, we might change our mind a little bit to become more similar to, to our friends. And second one, if we are exposed to something that we strongly disagree with, we can unfriend uh, the friends that exposed us to that information. And in this case, these connections are automatically rewired with random connections. So here's the simulation running. The dashed lines represent links that are cut, where we decide to unfollow somebody that we disagree with. And then in its place, we follow somebody at random, which is represented here by the solid lines. And you can see that the colors are changing. Uh, at the beginning, we had the whole spectrum of beliefs, and after a while, we see that we have uh, the people, the accounts, dividing themselves into a reddish group and a bluish group, and there isn't so much diversity anymore. And at the same time, the network is also sorting itself out into the liberal group and the conservative group, and accounts tend more, more likely to link to people who are similar to them and less likely to link to accounts that are dissimilar to them. And this is inevitable. Uh, if we run this simulation many, many times, we always end up with very similar outcomes where you have a few groups that are very homogeneous. So you see now that the reds are almost all similar colors among themselves. The blue are all very similar to each other. We've lost the initial heterogeneity of views. So we end up with very homogeneous clusters that are segregated. Eventually, all the links between the groups disappear and we have these homogeneous, segregated and polarized groups. And this is an inevitable consequence of just these two ingredients of influence and unfriending. And you, if you want, you can play with this model. It's 
available at a public demo. Here's, here's the URL down here, and you can play with the different parameters. But what's interesting here is that as long as there is a little bit of influence, a non-zero probability of having some influence from your friends, and a non-zero probability of unfriending uh, accounts that are dissimilar from yours, then inevitably you end up with these segregated and polarized groups. And you could have something sim a similar outcome with only one of these ingredients. But when both the ingredients are present, the unfollowing and the influence, uh, this emergence of echo chambers happens very, very quickly. So, so social media, in some sense, can uh, accelerate the emergence of these echo chambers. And that was my uh, reasons number four, uh, why social media make us vulnerable. Uh, reason number three is information overload. Now, here is a, a picture of the diffusion network for one particular piece of fake news that was spreading virally during the 2016 elections. It was a false article on Infowars about the Clinton campaign being involved in some satanic rituals. And this was one of the most viral pieces of fake news at that time. Uh, this is actually not even the entire network, it's just the core of it. We can see that some nodes that are large circles here were highly influential. This is probably the source of Infowars and its uh, friends. And then we also see that there are a bunch of kind of reddish accounts here, and these are likely bots that were involved in amplifying the spread of, of this particular piece of fake news. And I'll come back and talk about social bots more later. Now, if you look at rather than one single piece of news, you look at many, many pieces of uh, both uh, false claims as well as uh, uh, fact-checking uh, claims that were spreading at that time, uh, you observe a probability distribution like this at the top left, where most, um, most pieces of information are unlikely to go viral, but there are a few, this, this broad, heavy tail of the distribution that go very viral. As in this particular example, these articles were shared uh, over 30,000 uh, times. Um, and, and the disturbing thing that you notice here is that the distributions for the, for the false claims and for fact checking are, are very similar to each other. In other words, uh, low credibility information is just as likely, sometimes even more likely, to spread virally than reliable information. So why is that? Uh, and to explore this, whether finite attention and information overload could play a role in this, again, we turn to an agent-based model, a very simplified model, similar to the one that I showed you earlier. We have these agents, they share things, they share uh, memes or hashtags, and you can create something new or you can reshare something posted by your friends with some probabilities. I'm not, I don't have time to go into the detail of the model, but we can track how things spread. And importantly, in this model, all the different things that are shared by the, by the agents are equivalent. They're just like random numbers, okay? There, it's, there's not a situation where some uh, pieces of information are high quality uh, and others are low quality. It's all completely random. And we found that two ingredients are sufficient to explain these patterns of virality that I showed earlier, this broad distribution of popularity with these heavy tails. And the two conditions are one is that the network has to look like a social network in the sense that it has to have hubs and a clustering structure. And two is that the agents have to have limited attention. So in other conditions where the network is more random or the agents uh, have more attention, meaning that they can look at more things on their news feed before deciding what to share, you don't get these broad uh, distributions. But if the network looks like an actual social network and agents have limited attention, they only look at a few things in their feed and then choose one of them to reshare, then you find these broad distributions. So in other words, you have some things that become viral without having any reason, any quality to it. So you don't need to assume that some things are better or more interesting than others uh, to explain the fact that they go viral. It's inevitable that some things will go viral. Now, what happens now in this model, everything was random. What happens if you change the model to add an ingredient where the where the accounts are, the users are able to tell whether something is high quality or low quality, and the probability of sharing a meme is proportional 
to the quality of that mean. Now here we expect a correlation between quality and popularity, right? A more high, higher quality items should be more likely to spread viral. To some extent, we do observe that. There is a correlation between uh, popularity and, and quality, which is represented by the color in this density plot here. So darker means higher correlation. And we see that when the information load is low, there, there is the, that um, meaning that there are fewer things that are spreading on the network, or each agent has higher attention, that is that they could look at more things before deciding what to share, then the correlation is higher which is represented in this network by, by bigger nodes, because the size of the node here represents the quality of the mean that they're sharing. So we see a higher correlation between quality and popularity. But when the information load is higher or the attention of the individual agent is lower, then we see here uh, smaller nodes, which means that low quality information is more likely to go, to go viral. There is a lower correlation between quality and popularity. So even in a situation where users can tell what's good and prefer to share what's good, still a lot of junk will go viral. Number two, platform bias. Um, we use the same bots that I told you before to try to measure as they were drifting through the space of information uh, on Twitter, whether they were, um, you know, stayed in their lanes or, or moved and evolved. And of course, as I said before, whether you start on the right or on the left has a big impact of where you end up. However, while conservative accounts stayed pretty much on the conservative side, uh, and this is based on the political uh, valence that we measure from the links that they share or from the hashtags that they share, uh, the, uh, 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 and, when, and also by what, what they find in their, uh, by what we observe in their, in their home timeline, which is posted by their friends, uh, we see that uh, the accounts on the right stay on the right, but the accounts on the left tend to shift towards the center here. Uh, so we don't believe that this is due to a bias of the platform, but uh, the environment constituted by the other accounts that interact with these bots and possibly even in authentic accounts uh, pushes, um, you know, the liberals more towards the center and the conservative uh, are stay, stay on the conservative side. So there may be a, a, a bias of the platform, even though this is not necessarily driven by algorithms of the platform itself. But let's look at algorithmic bias. Now, one thing that we know platforms do is that they give importance to popularity. They use popularity as signals of quality. And this makes sense, right? If a lot of people are sharing something, there must be something good about it. And the whole idea of uh, the wisdom of the crowd uh, is at the basis of this. So platforms uh, take these signals of popularity and engagement and make it more likely that we see something if a lot of other people, especially our friends, are, are sharing or liking or interacting with that bit. So we build a model uh, similar to the ones I described earlier, where the platform, with some probability, uh, selects the things to show us based on their popularity, based on how many times they've been uh, shared or liked by other, uh, other users. And otherwise, they do it based on actual quality. There is also a parameter here on the y-axis, which is, uh, think of it as the attention, like I showed you before. Higher attention, lower on this plot means that you uh, look at few things before deciding what, what to share. Now, what we observe here, that in general, as the probability of selecting memes by popularity by the algorithm increases, the average meme quality in the entire system becomes lower, these darker colors here. So this means that the engagement bias of the platforms in general uh, lowers the quality of information in the system because it amplifies random fluctuations, noise at the beginning. Some things may be liked by a bunch of people, not because they're good, but just by random chance. And then the algorithm kind of amplifies that. Um, now there is a narrow range of attention that you see in this yellow band here, in which some amount of uh, probability of selecting memes by popularity actually helps. It increases the quality. Now, if you then do it even more, then uh, things get worse again. But so this, this band represents 
you know, the wisdom of the, of the crowd. There are circumstances in which uh, engagement provides useful signals, but those circumstances are very narrow. And in general, uh, in exposure or, or the use of engagement signals may actually make things worse. Now, this is from, from the point of view of the platform. What about users? Because users see these engagement signals, right? Um, uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter tell you how many people have liked or shared uh, some post. So to explore this question, we built an app called Fakey, which you can download and play with. Uh, it's a game. Uh, here's the link. Uh, it runs on iPhones and Androids and uh, uh, phones. And uh, you look at a bunch of news. You look at uh, you know, the headline and the description and the picture, and you have to decide whether to share it or fact check it. So it's a, it's a news literacy game. Now, one thing that we did is we manipulated the engagement uh, signal here. Uh, the number of times that uh, some item that the player is seeing uh, got liked or shared by other people. This was completely at random. And what we found is that the more people thought that some news article was shared or liked by other people, the more they were like to share it, even if the link was a link to a low credibility article. And uh, likewise, the more they thought that it had high engagement, uh, the less likely users were to fact check uh, the article. So in this case, the mere exposure to the engagement signals made people more vulnerable to misinformation, more likely to share it and less likely to fact check it. And finally, uh, reason number one is manipulation. Uh, so we've been studying social bots for several years, since uh, about 2010. That's when we observed the first instances of social bots. We either coined um, the term social bots. And uh, on, on the right here, you see a couple of accounts that were tweeting and retweeting each other thousands of times to support a particular political candidate here on the left. Uh, on the left, we see a bunch of bots that were coordinated, trying to push links to a fake news website, trying to get a target, a journalist in the center to retweet it. Since then, there has been a lot of research on, on social bots, of course. Uh, around the 2016 elections, we collected a lot of links to low credibility and fact-checking websites to look at the structure of the network of diffusion of, of misinformation. And again, in, in purple here, we see low credibility, we see the, the network of accounts that are sharing low credibility uh, links. And you see that um, they're much less likely to share links to fact-checking websites. Uh, not particularly surprising there. But as you move closer and closer to the core of this network, we also observe that there are more bots, that the average bot score of accounts in the core of this misinformation network increases. And I'll tell you later how we measure the bot score. But the point here is that bots or automated or semi-automated accounts, inauthentic accounts, can be used to inject misinformation in the network. And in fact, we also found this with our, with our bots. Uh, which were, uh, of course, the, all, all of these bots received a lot of uh, uh, bot followers. But if you look at the accounts that they followed, their friends, um, the, the bots that started more on the left or more on the right of the political uh, spectrum were more likely to follow accounts that were themselves uh, automated. So again, this idea that partisanship makes us vulnerable. Uh, and one way in which it makes us vulnerable is it uh, is through um, inauthentic accounts. What are these bots doing? Well, one thing is they, they do is they target um, influential accounts. Uh, the more an account is likely to be automated, the more it is likely to target influential accounts. Uh, in this example here, this is a network of spreading for a particular piece of fake news uh, that claimed that 3 million votes in presidential election were cast by illegal aliens. And we found one particular bot, which is this yellow dot here in the center of this, close to the center of this network, that was systematically uh, 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 replying or, uh, to uh, articles from 
mainstream media that mentioned uh, President Trump. And in the reply, it was including a link to this false news report. And this was done in a clear effort to expose the president in this particular case to this particular piece of fake news. So that's one of the things that bots do. Another one is that they amplify the spread of misinformation. And we can notice that this happens in the very few seconds after a piece of misinformation is posted. Within the first 10 seconds, we see that accounts that are likely automated are very likely to retweet it. Eventually, if more humans retweet the news, then we don't notice the presence of bots anymore. Uh, because, of course, many humans participate in the, in the cascade. But if we focus on the first few instances, we notice the bots. So obviously, these bots are working together in a coordinated fashion with, with the sources. And then, of course, the bots flood the network. Okay, So a single account uh, at, with a high bot score uh, can retweet the same link to the same piece of low credibility news thousands of times, as this plot showed us. Now, what is the impact? Uh, there's a lot of debate. It's hard to measure impact. But one thing that we can measure is retweets. So if we look at retweets of links to low credibility sources, we find that most of the retweets are done by the users. And this is what you see here when you project on the x-axis on this pl density plot, which is the bot score of the retweeter. You see that most of the retweeters have low bot sco score, so they are likely humans. But if you look at who these human, likely human accounts are retweeting, you see that they retweet other humans, but they also retweet other bots. So in other words, humans reshare misinformation from bots. So that's one kind of impact that we can observe. And more recently, we found the exact same patterns looking at the spread of misinformation about the coronavirus. Um, so if you look at uh, low credibility uh, sources and links about the pandemic from these sources, we see that a much higher percentage of these, of these tweets comes from likely bots. And likely bots both post and retweet uh, links to low credibility sites about the pandemic. And we don't observe that for links about the pandemic that come from mainstream sources. So what we see is that bots um, participate in the amplification of low credibility news in various domains, including health. Uh, this is a picture uh, from a few years ago regarding this, uh, the discussion about uh, vaccination policies. And we saw that some large red nodes here, which are likely accounts, could be likely bot accounts, could be very influential in this discussion. And we build agent-based uh, models to look at the effect of bots infiltrating a network on the average quality of information in the network. On the y-axis of this density plot, you see the information, uh, the, sorry, the infiltration of bots. So the red nodes here are the bots. If they infiltrate a very small portion of the network, then they have a smaller effect on the average quality. Here, we assume that the bots are only sharing low, low quality information. But in this situation here, when the bots penetrate and infiltrate the network to a larger degree, above 1% or so of the humans follow them, then we see that the average quality of the system becomes much lower. So bots can uh, basically um, suppress information in, in the network. Now, it's not only bots and automated account that can do damage. Here is an account, for example, that is probably not automated at all. This is a human. Uh, and if we look at it, it looks like, okay, so this is an, a political account, nothing particularly suspicious about it. But if you notice that there is a whole bunch of other accounts, they are very, very similar to these accounts in many ways. And by the way, some are pro-Trump and some are anti-Trump. This, this was a, now you understand that these are all controlled by a single entity. This was an entity that was trying to get money by making it look like it was a political campaign, trying to get money from, from both sides. And so these are the kind of coordinated campaigns that we would like to, to detect, even if they don't involve automation. And we found these kind of coordinated uh, campaigns in many domains by looking, for example, here at how accounts share uh, and rotate the same handle to avoid detection uh, by Twitter. And we found some large coordinated networks in this way. 
uh, in, in spread of information about coronavirus, we found some clusters of coordinated accounts that were basically all uh, sharing the same links. Uh, we found similar patterns in the Hong Kong protests when, when we found large networks of accounts that were sharing the exact same images or very, very small variations of similar, similar images. And we found this both pro and anti-protest. Uh, uh, looking at uh, political messages, we looked at accounts with very, very long sequences of hashtags that were basically identical. And so we realized that, of course, it was unlikely that humans could do this. And by inspecting these clusters, we found that they were using uh, applications that posted on behalf of the users to make it look like uh, there were humans who were posting these political uh, messages. But in fact, there was a single entity that was controlling all of these accounts. And similar patterns we found in discussions about uh, white helmets in, in Syria. Uh, which were attacked by uh, Russian sources, for example, and this was done by looking at um, uh, accounts that retweeted this, the same accounts. And in um, uh, cryptocurrency manipulation, pump and dump schemes, uh, accounts that were posting at the same time trying to pump the price of some cryptocurrencies for, for fraud. Now, what do we do about this? I'm almost out of time. Let me tell you very, very briefly that one of the things that we do in our lab is we develop some tools to help people understand this kind of manipulation. So a very popular tool is Bottometer, which is a machine learning tool to detect uh, automated accounts and um, a lot of people use it. Another tool is called Hoxy, which is a website for visualizing the spread of information and misinformation from account to account. And our latest tool is called Bot Slayer. There is a link there, you can play with it. This lets anybody set up their own infrastructure in the cloud on AWS to collect tweets and analyze them and extract entities, for example, keywords, links, pictures, uh, hashtags, and so on, and see if there are accounts, either automated or coordinated accounts that are pushing certain narratives. Like in this picture, for example, we see a bunch of Russian bots that were pushing a video that was attacking a particular target, uh, Bill Browder. And so you can detect this kind of coordinated campaigns using Bot Slayer in real time. And we're actively developing it and um, we hope within days to release a, the, a, a version ready for the elections and, uh, and coronavirus so that uh, journalists and practitioners and and uh, the public and anyone can use these tools to basically do their own research in this area. Now to finish, um, just to summarize, what do these findings tell us? Is the interplay of cognitive, social and algorithmic biases make us vulnerable to misinformation? Social bots and coordinated campaigns can exploit these vulnerabilities and tools to study information diffusion networks and bots and these kind of campaigns can help us understand and counter manipulation of the information ecosystem. Um, a shameless, shameless plug, uh, this is a textbook that we just published uh, on network science and we hope you'll find it interesting. And let me close by thanking uh, the many wonderful students and postdocs and colleagues at the Observatory on Social Media at Indiana University all the work that you've seen, of course, uh, would not happen without them. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions.